more as a laboratory, and many other things, finally reaching the, the, I mean, the, the concentration camps. But this starts, I mean, going back to the 18th century, 19th century, and so on and so forth. And here, what I did, I mean, in a way, it's like, a, I mean, if this was a, a marathon, like I wanted to take a kind of, a, how do you say, the baton or something like that. Because basically, what I do is, in a way, the opposite, although it's continuing the chronology, because here it starts, in a way, with Nazi violence and, and the 19th century and classic fascism. And I want to, uh, uh, I want to uh, go into the future, or into the dictatorship. And here, it, the challenge is to analyze each moment in its own context. But I'm having in mind, of course, I'm having in mind the word of the dictatorship, which would be the end of the, the book, but also what motivated me to basically start writing about these topics in the first place. And that was also a challenge, to have this in mind without being a kind of a, 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 too much of a signifier, because the idea is really to put these ideas I mean, in this particular uh, context, uh, in ter uh, understanding them in terms of their own. So, but, but your work has been extremely influential for me. And um, now, in terms of uh, the, the different, uh, the, the, the many suggestions that you have, um, I mean, regarding the issue of reactionary modernism, uh, I, I think, uh, yes, that is it's a, it's a great one, that explains a lot. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's um, it is particularly so when you analyze Christianized fascism. Although, as you know, I don't I don't use it that much in the book. Like I mean, it's part of my. But I mean, I I, I read that, that work by Jeffrey Kirk many years ago, and and, and um, but I don't know. I have to think about this because it's not it's not uh, as far as I can tell. It's not in a, a word or a or a term that I would use. Why? I mean, my only. I mean, although uh, I mean the term really describes a lot, and, and I will not I disagree with the with the with the approach or the description. My point is, and this is something that actually we agree on, I mean, my point would be that sometimes reactionary modernism doesn't understand or doesn't, doesn't uh, let's say, um, approach well the idea of how there were many synergies between revolution and counter-revolution, and suddenly counter-revolutions that could be uh, quite revolutionary, or, or at least wanted to be revolutionary. Because, I mean, Father Castellani, by saying that, is that these guys want to be revolutionary. And that is more important, eventually, than, than I, I mean, that par paradoxically, I was going to say, traditional ideologies. Which, in a way, brings me back to my understanding of ideology, which is not that of, a, 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 you know, um, other approaches uh, um, uh, to the history of ideas, uh, specifically in Argentina. Because, for me, the, I mean, the ideology, um, I mean, having said that, my next book is on the world, and a great thinker, and so on. But having said that, I mean, basically to me, the ideology is something, I mean, I, I, it's something that is, uh, that is shared by many, and it changes all the time, and it's reformulated again and again, and yet there are certain threats, to go back to, to, Nara's, uh, to Nara's point. Um, <coughs> but the idea would be that, that, uh, that some of these, the, the nastiest of guys, I mean, because of course a Lugon is, is much more interesting and certainly smarter than a Filippo. But Filippo is equally important. And some of the guys are even unknown. I mean, I'm using a lot of sources that are, I mean, sometimes we don't even know who is talking because it's coming from an archive, like a police informant who heard <coughs> some, someone talking and so on. But the, uh, but the idea is that I'm also very, very much interested in, in, the, in the revolutionary or counter, I mean, the synergy between revolution and counter revolution, and sometimes the stress on the word rationality, which is probably not the emphasis in her, but I very, sometimes I'm uh, reactive towards the word rationality in that particular sense. That it will somehow mean that these people want to go back to the past. And, and, and basically, the past that they are talking about is fully invented in so far as the origins of Argentina are liberal origins. So they are in, inventing traditions in a very radical way. Uh, even to the extent that sometimes they might recognize that, that even if there is some fictional element here, this is the truth. Which is interesting because then it describes this in a very ideological sense, which is the word of the mythical. Because what is truth, in, uh, according to fascist ideology, and this is part of also my kind of future work, what is truth is basically what, the, what, what, is, uh, what is related to the world of the mythical, not necessarily to the world of the historical or the rational. So that is the truth, even if his, the historical record doesn't agree with it. I mean, that can be changed. The need, perhaps, is, I mean, so basically, that's why I'm not using, I guess, I always think why I didn't use it, because it's something that you call me on, you put me on the spot, and, and, I, and I have to think about that, because, uh, because I don't use it, although it's not that I, dis I, I will disagree, because the paradox here is, of course, they want to go back to the past. 
they are saying this. They so many times will defend themselves, present themselves as rationality, but they were kind of past. It was never there. Uh, and, and this is a and this is a problem that they are constantly grappling grappling with. Um, now, uh, uh, on the, uh, we talk about this. Uh, the cultural turn, I mean, and, which you rightly criticize and full and I fully agree. I mean, uh, the, which is the, the criticism of, of the too much emphasis on, on, on the things that Mosi and Chantilly have have been doing. Uh, also, um, I think will perfect. It could be at least a, some some criticism applied to my Uriburu, because I was very much influenced by that paradigm then, this is in 2002, and I was writing it in the, I, mean, I guess in the 1990s and early 2000s, and, and that is, a, you know, a criticism that I will do of myself, I mean, and, and we were talking about this in the South, people change, <laughs> but, it's, but it's interesting because uh, on the other hand, I mean, I try to, to still put out there like the issue of the logic of the practice and, and the practices of this, I mean, of these groups. And the last chapter of the dictator we wants to be that. I mean, the moment in which finally, after so many reformulations, the, uh, uh, these ideas are made tangible. Uh, they are put into practice in the lives of the victims. And um, but, I, but, but certainly, I agree. I certainly agree that this this book is a discussion with that previous paradigm, uh, because that previous paradigm doesn't emphasize the issue of, 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 of violence in the way that I am doing in the end of the book. I mean, the practice now is the talk. It's not the, let's say, uh, in the places of memory, as I did in my guru book or something like that. It's suddenly I mean, a different sort of practice, which is, which is perhaps more, more radically ideological. Um, now, uh, the, then, um, now the, the issue of, I mean, the, the issue of Spain, I, I, I think also you are putting me on the spot, and it's a great question, and I have to. I mean, I would provide only a temporary answer. Uh, the easiest of answers is that people like Daniel will help me there by writing their, their books. Uh, but, it's, uh, but still, that is not an excuse. It's not, I mean, in my last book, I could have answered, well, there is a section on, on Hispanidad. I mean, there is a section on Nazis and a section on Hispanidad. And my claim is that, again, like I feel that there, this is more important in, in, the, in the source. In addition to the French, and perhaps I was thinking about this, part of my reaction, sometimes you know, one engages in a kind of, a, um, you know, in every book one emphasizes more some aspects than others, and, and, but that doesn't mean that those others are less important. And there is also a, a, new, a new emphasis on how basically this is Spanish. I mean, in the same way as French and, 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 and US uh, influence now, some historians are basically presenting this as a kind of a, a this is what these guys learned from Kant. And the story, uh, as I see it, is a little bit different in the sense that with all of them, you know, these are radical narcissists, fascists, radical Argentines in the worst sense of the term. Um, I mean, by basically emphasizing Argentine, the, the notions of Argentine essence, I mean, and so on, I mean, a very kind of radical nationalism. They believe uh, that, uh, that they were like, basically better than everybody else, they were better than the Italians, they were better than the fascists. In my section on Hispanidad, I noted that, that they actually believed that, that, the, that they were representing the true Spain. So they wanted the all. They wanted all. So they wanted the legacy of the Roman Empire, they wanted the legacy of the golden age of the Spanish Empire, and they said Spain entered decadence, and the base of Spain, the warriors, remain in the Americas, and specifically in Argentina. They don't explain that much. They don't explain why Pizarro didn't visit Argentina and so on. But, but that, was the, that, that was the explanation. So, um, and they always felt, but also it is because of that. Uh, uh, also, the, sorry, what I was going to say is that as opposed to Nazis or, or, or Italians, or even the, 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 the influence of French literature and the so-called sophistication of the French, and I say so-called, but sometimes it's not so called. Sometimes these intellectuals were more sophisticated, sometimes they were not. And, but certainly they were objects of great admiration. Uh, the Spaniards were not taken in, in, in such a way. There is a tradition of anti Hispanism in Argentina. This is, the Spaniards are the working classes. Ironically, so this didn't happen as very much with Italians also. The Italians were, were part of the working class. But this didn't happen that much with Italians in Argentine fascism. One can see this in people like Borges. In, let's say in anti-fascist, but not so much in the in the fascists. I mean, they, they, they perhaps uh, this didn't happen. Uh, but the Spaniards, they always believed that they were uh, 
actual peers, because at some point they also recognize, I mean, some of them recognize that, that, you know, that De Luce and, and Hitler were also at, at a level of power that Argentina was not, although they were minimizing them in, through, the, through, through the obvious, uh, I mean, obvious in terms of their own ideology, that they were not Catholic, Catholic enough. With the Spaniards, it's different because they, you know, perhaps they were Catholic enough, but they also felt that Spain was an underdeveloped, I mean, that I mean before the, uh, let's say, before 45. Spain was an underdeveloped country that is sending us poor people, and we are the true legacy of Spain, they would say, the, the true inheritors of the Spanish Empire. And finally, they will add to that that Spain is a country in decadence, and, uh, and that is living a civil war, I mean, and they, they, so many of them travel to the civil war, Spain is living a civil war that Argentina may have to live or not, because we are there to, to basically avoid it to avoid the civil war. Uh, so now, after 45, the story changes. And I have a chapter on Peronism, which I take as a, as a kind of the tour. Because I, I see, I mean, it's a the tour in the sense that it's a contextual the tour. I mean, basically, one, has to, one would have to say that this tradition of Argentine fascism goes silent. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little, but during the years of Peronism, they go silent. Why? Because they do not work that well, and this is not an Argentine, uh, a unique Argentine phenomenon. Brazil, for example, is similar with Indegalismo and Vargas, and, and certainly Hungary and other places. Fascism doesn't thrive that well with authoritarian governments because authoritarian governments crush them. And basically, in Peru and Argentina, you are with me, Peru will say, and, or otherwise you will face the same fate as other people who are in the opposition. So you will not have the possibility that you have in democracy, even in the democracy of the decade in Farme, the limited democracy of the decade in Farme, to basically publish your own things, say your own things, and, and, and have radio programs and so on. So in Peronism, basically they kind of, either they shut up or they join the regime, which, I mean, many of them join the regime. Uh, and by doing that, they cease to be fascists, as I see it, and they engage in a kind of reformulation of fascism, which Populism. And I would say, actually, this is also another thread in my new work, that, that, is a, that, a, that, a, that this was as a regime, and in terms of after 45, this is the first case of a populist regime in the world, in Peronism, which is basically rooted in a rejection of the fascist violence, with a fascist violence, but basically the creation of an authoritarian democracy, which is not the dictatorship that fascism created and advocated for. So Peron never went into the dictatorial manner, uh, with a caveat that I would return to, if I can. Uh, so, but basically, during the years of terrorism, again, I mean, there is a book that uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Ranan Ray, published, which is The Salvation of a Dictatorship. And it's about how Perón basically saved Franco, giving them, giving them food, giving them some sort of international leg legitimacy that they lack. Because Argentina was one of the few countries supporting Franco in, let's say, 45, 46, 47, and before the U.S. realized somehow that this was an ally in the Cold War, but basically they were, I mean, there was a moment in which there was debate, international debate about whether, uh, uh, whether Franco should remain or not. And Perón was a kind of lifeline to Franco, uh, which Franco then was very grateful for, and, and then Perón lived in Franco Spain for a long time. Uh, so then Spain was, in a way, again, a country which was underdeveloped, very inferior to Argentina, and they were helping them. Now, the situation changes after Perón goes, goes, uh, goes down in 55, and then the, the, relation, the relationship between becomes a little bit more equal. But then again, I mean, you have to think that the, eventually, somehow the Franco regime is, I, I, you know, perhaps liberalization is not the best word, but it's kind of going moderate, whereas they are looking for a, for a more, uh, uh, let's say, radical uh, way of doing politics. So, Basically, they would, and sometimes the ones that were moderate were in the Franco direction. Whereas they were, I mean, and this is also in the sources, generally they would advocate more for the Nazi or, or, or Italian model, as they understand it. So this is my, again, like, I mean, it doesn't mean that, this is, I guess, why I did not see it that much, but it, 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 it is there, and it's something that needs to be explored. Um, and even to the extent that the Franco dictatorship, and I don't know how this might be, and, and Daniel will study this, uh, I hope, uh, might be also one of the models for a dictatorship that eventually wants to cease to be a dictatorship but remain somehow in power with a law of, 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 a, of amnesty that, that is not going to be touched. So again, by the end of the dictatorship, the Franco model also is interesting and, and how it transitions to democracy without the ways in which it did in Argentina. So they are also interested in that, but this is a kind of country because I haven't studied that. Um, and then, uh, uh, something that you said, and, 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 and it's, I should shut up in five minutes, right? Or something. Uh, 
So something that I will just move to Malian, uh, and something that you said that is that is that, that I, I I haven't realized. I have to say, and, and when you were uh, emphasizing it, wow, this is the case. That is that the impact of the I mean, oh, the impact of this it, it has in many ways uh, 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 was deeper and longer in Argentina, particularly if you if you include this kind of the tour rejection and yet incorporation of some fascist uh, uh, ideas in what peronism is, which is now I mean, uh, uh, a regime that certainly is not fascist, I mean, it's a democracy uh, and so on, but this is the, the beginning, this is how it emerged. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Daniel, uh, you know, I know, this is also something that Nara uh, noted, and, and again, like and I mentioned, is that the way I do intellectual history is trying to incorporate the great ideas and the great writers, of course we shouldn't reject them, with, with other, I mean, basically with other, with other thoughts and other practices, and this is how I approach it, and, and eventually it's this kind of trashy nasty people that, that emerge. Uh, but uh, um, now, uh, and this is very personal, yeah, well, I hope my fascination with the sources is not uh, I mean, I'm not politically fascinated with them at all, actually. The constant struggle that I have as an historian is, again, not to engage in this kind of utter rejection, because of course they are that, but rather try to put some distance and understand why they are doing what they, why they are doing, how they explain them, this to themselves, which is ideology, how they justify their actions, what is, uh, what is basically what is meaning making for them and what. So this is, uh, this is also very important for me. Um, and, and, and you know, and Daniel stressed something that, that I, uh, is a, believe it or not, is a constant struggle in Argentina, which is, which should be a no starter, but, but some many historians in Argentina still maintain that Argentina is very different and these people are not fascist. And to them, I have basically a fantastic title, uh, again, the quotes are great, which is the title of the book by uh, Otalagan, which is a character that I talked a lot about, because he was a fascist in the 19th, a nationalist of fascist in the 1930s, eventually becoming uh, basically a, an ally of the AAA and a, and a horrible president of the University of Buenos Aires. And his book, one of his most famous books, is basically, this is the title. Soy fascista y qué? I'm a fascist, so what? So I think he explains. Okay. Uh, the, with, with, Jose, with Jose, yes, I mean, uh, Jose and Nara, I'm emphasizing this issue of the threats and the roots. Yes, this is exactly what I want to uh, and, and it's also true. That, I was thought about that in the previous book, I was doing the webs, and, and, and it's, it's really a great way of approaching this. And, and Jose also emphasized the issue of ideology and why they, I mean, and again, like, I wanted to understand why they keep, and to put it even more broadly, why, why we have this kind of surplus of violence, you know, which is ideological. It's, it's a kind of a surplus of violence that is not, certainly not needed in a strategic or even in terms of counterinsurgency, because by the time of the coup d'etat, the ERP and Montoneros were militarily defeated. So they started the coup d'etat, they have defeated them, and they start killing more people than before. So why do we do this? And there are fantastic quotes here. One of them is uh, by a general that says, first we will kill the, the guerrillas, or the subversive, as they call them. Then they will, we will kill uh, their, um, their supporters. And finally, we will kill the shy, which is, again, like, those that are uncommitted to the project of the, the dictatorship. Which is interesting because, of course, this is an expression of desire, but this is exactly how I see ideology. Because this is, he's saying what he wants. I mean, not necessarily what he will do, but also in terms of their actions. Now, in terms of, and going back to the issue, I mean, I, rather than, I mean, they, I mean, one of the issues, they are obsessed with fascism, and they are obsessed with, with Nazi ideology, and specifically they are obsessed with the Nazi leaders, the fascist leaders, and the Holocaust. And, and again, how, I mean, because eventually, I agree, it's bizarre, like why you would torture people by playing them uh, speeches by, by Hitler or Mussolini, and generally these were the speeches. So I see this as a moment of ideological inscription, which is a moment of meaning making for the perpetrators, because they believe and they want to register their particular acts of violence within a larger history of fascist violence. So if Peronism rejected, rejected that violence and created an authoritarian democracy, they want to go back and they want to reinitiate that violence. And this is exactly what they told the victims. So, I mean, the way I deal with the victims is also, I use them as a particular, as, as very powerful testimonies because they are there, they are experiencing, sadly, a horrible instantiation of fascist ideology. And this is what exactly they are telling them. So you talk to someone and you tell them, 
why you are torturing them. And what they basically tell the victims is that, for example, and specifically the Jewish victims, which is another paradox, apparent paradox, which is why a segment of the population which was less than 1% of the population 